Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photo editor Clinton Cargill as tonight's guest speaker. Clinton is currently visuals director at Vanity Fair magazine. Previously, he worked as director of photography for Bloomberg Business Week and Bloomberg Markets magazines. During his tenure at Biz Business Week, the magazine's photography won recognition by American Photography, Pictures of the Year International, the Society of Publication Designers, the Creative Review, Photo District News, and the American Society of Magazine Editors. Before joining Business Week, Clinton was a photo editor at the New York Times Magazine, where he worked from 2004 to 2014. He has taught courses on editorial photography at the International Center of Photography and serves on the board of directors at the Center for Photography at Woodstock. He is currently the president of the Society of Publication Designers. Aside from being a distinguished photo editor, Clinton is one of the most generous and gracious uh, leaders of our industry. So it is our great privilege to welcome him tonight to our lecture series. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures and probably talk too fast. Um, and I th think the way that I think about my career is kind of, um, I totally stumbled into this work in, um, in the, the, the best case of dumb luck you can possibly imagine. I studied theater in college. I was a dropout. I was like tempted in like virtually every building in Midtown and um, was like, uh, I used to tell, I used to go to parties and tell people that um, I was in a chrysalis and I was waiting to figure out like what I would become. And um, I, it was a, it was like a the kind of thing you say just because people always ask what you do and you have no idea what to say. And um, so when I, when I lucked into a job as the photo assistant at the New York Times Magazine, um, I didn't, I didn't understand how good it was. And um, I'm, I'm like a, a situationally intelligent person who maybe isn't as well read as I sometimes come across. And so a lot of times I find myself in places where I think like, I have, to, I have a lot to figure out right now, um, which is actually where I am currently at Vanity Fair. Um, so I, I always think it's, you know, as a, as a person still learning on my journey, I think it's not so helpful to people along the way to kind of make it sound like it was all meant to be. None of it was meant to be. Um, it's luck, it's work, it's time. Um, and so, and then it's, it's learning. So I, I'm kind of couching this as like the way that I learned to be a photo editor and um, how, how that has evolved and how I have developed um, sort of through that. So anyway, that's really, that's what it's going to be. But um, you feel free to stop me if you have questions um, or if I'm, uh, you know, if you're having trouble hearing me or anything like that. So um, I'll first just show you a few, um, a few of my favorite covers from the New York Times Magazine. Um, this was uh, what is now a very old story about uh, the nationalized oil industry in Venezuela. But I, um, this was photographed by Amboise Tezana, a beautiful large format landscape photographer. Um, this is, I think, 2008. Um, this jumps ahead a few years to about 2012. Um, this is the special forces in Africa assisting um, uh, with uh, U.S. special forces working on the ground to assist sort of local and national military organizations um, in fight Boko Haram, but also um, this story, they were looking for Kony, um, who you may remember was um, like a sort of scoundrel of the moment in um, Uganda. Uh, around that time. Um, this is a, a portfolio by Michelle Asseline about uh, nannies called The Other Mothers of Manhattan. Um, Joe Biden, photographed by Taryn Simon. Um, Alicia Keys, for, uh, photographed by Peter Hoppock for our inspiration issue. Um, so the whole, it was like a whole issue looking at kind of like how art gets made. And this was right around the time that Girl on Fire was released, so I sang it. Played it over and over again until the whole department was sick of it. Um, this was a cover story after Hurricane Katrina about four years. There was um, like a really terrible but very 
ethically, journalistically interesting um, situation at one hospital there where a, a, a sort of for-profit long-term care hospital had been housed on top of another um, another corporation but in the same building. And um, these people were basically the kind of people that you that were really hard to triage once the floodwaters came and many of them died and, and um, a, the the story was that the doctor who had been in charge of this unit um, had essentially kind of take the, the the question was whether she had taken it into her own hands to euthanize people who she couldn't mm -hmm. um, triage out of of the hospital and so this was like a 12,000 word piece reconstructing everything that happened on that floor and we sent the photographer Paolo Pellegrin to basically like break into the upper floors of this hospital and photograph in the old ward that was condemned um, and that's what that is. Um, I brought this because Rodney Smith died this year and he was such an amazing joyful imaginative artist and I got one day with him in his um, beautiful home in Rockland County uh, for this crazy story about like the mattress business um, and it was essentially it the the upshot of it was like you'll never sleep well no matter what but it was a kind of a marketing story about how people and and this is another funny one to look at now as I'm like constantly seeing Casper ads on my you know social media or I'll, um, anyway you'll never get a good night's sleep um, this was for an education issue that we produced um, in this, this whole this whole issue was on teaching, but the idea when I worked at the Times Magazine was that we would hire students in undergrad or grad school um, to photograph everything that we shot in these issues. So this was um, a big production that we shot. Um, David Laspina photographed it in his second year at Yale, and it was like we, there was a cherry picker. Do you know what that is? Like, and. Um, the entire Yale MFA photo program were on deck as sort of production assistants and stylists and things like that. Um, this is a story about, um, shot by Andrew B. Myers about the new math. Um, just a kind of a, a just a favorite because it's fun. Um, okay, so now this is my f the first assignment that I ever did when I worked at the New York Times Magazine, and I I always come back to this because it was so by by way of context. Um, my aunt happens to be a very avid birder, like is married to the president of the American Birding Association. And, like my whole childhood life, like I spent a lot of time with her and I hated birds. Um, and I hated birding and they had parrots in the house and just, uh, but so like I have this kind of exposure to this certain kind of like naturalist. Um, and so the story came up, it was about in 2005, there was a guy who thought that he had spotted an ivory-billed woodpecker, which is a long extinct, uh, it was the, the king of birds or something like that, uh, like, a, like this big, magnificent woodpecker that only lived like in the, rem at the, in the remotest parts of like rural Arkansas. And so this was like a good, easy first assignment, right? Like just go with the guy, like send a photographer with the guy who like goes out and hunts the bird. And it like basically an environmental portrait, right? But like 25-year-old Clinton, really thinking it all through, like, um, I went to the Museum of Natural History to hear this man speak about his, you know, this discovery that he'd had. And it, it was very controversial because of like wing flaps and like where the white parts on the bird were. And then also like what if, like what if you were there and you actually saw the ivory billed wood, woodpecker like while you were out with this man, like then that would be news. We couldn't hold it for the magazine, et cetera, et cetera. Like just like the weirdest kind of fantasies. And and, not, and that then like helped along by my boss genius, Kathy, editor, Kathy Ryan, photo editor. But, so I had this picture in my mind, and I have, I'm from Texas, I have family in Louisiana, I've driven across the bayou many times, and so I like had in my mind like a kind of swampy, cypressy world that you were going to get into, remote, like everything about the story suggested that it was so remote, and we sent this totally great photographer, Lane Coder, out to take the pictures, beautiful medium format film, contact sheets in those days. They all came back in every single picture. There was this bridge and I was just like, that's not remote. Like, it's right off the highway. And um, it, <laughs> it made me crazy, you know? And I was like, oh, these are terrible. What a failure. And um, the lesson is, it totally doesn't matter. But the thing you have to do as a picture editor is to kind of like form in your mind what 
a story should be, what an image should be. And then basically like let it go because it's not yours. You're the midwife. And so this was, I always come back to this because it's where, it's where I learned, you know, not to get too attached to an idea and, and that like the goal is to give someone else the space to create. Um, again, similar lesson. This was a, a, a cover story about um, school lunches, like, and trying to make them healthier and the economics of like cheap french fries and how much more expensive when you buy them in bulk like yams are to make mashed potatoes and so the whole story was about this like these school districts in florida that had tried to basically like bulk buy these things and it was it like breaks the budget and so and things may have gotten better since then but not significantly probably um so it was like looking at the economics of it but also just like people actually trying to do this well well do you see a lunch tray there no, right? And the whole story, so I was like, oh, and I like love lunch trays. I remember them from school. And I thought, you know, that we were going to sort of construct this thing and that would be the cover. And then um, Gail Bickler, who's now the, desi the design director at the Times Magazine, had this idea of like it's junk food, but then like wholesome things are coming out. So we had like a, I mean, this is the most obvious, but we had, you know, a McDonald's French fry container with like beautiful yams and like the incredible food stylist Victoria Granoff worked on it. Stephen Lewis shot it, but not a lunch tray to be seen. And I, it, does it matter? No. It, like, if you have a, an idea for like a really striking picture, it doesn't have to be a literal read on what, on what the story was. And again, that was just like, like the folly of youth, I guess. That's, that's kind of why I show this. Um, this is by Jeff Mermelstein. Um, this was, would have been like after the 2008, election or right before the 2008 election tom davis was a congressman from virginia had been in, in for years and just decided not to run for re-election and i i love this um looking at jeff mermelstein's contact sheets really taught me how to be a photo editor and i would add with him the two like the two people who i probably learned the most from it's jeff mermelstein and mark peterson because those guys hustle and they're never not looking for a different angle they're falling to the floor they're getting up high they're they're back they're forward and i just i mean there's like an adley stevenson from the 1950 you know like was a perennial presidential candidate and he he was photographed once with his shoes up on a thing and he had like holes in them and so there's kind of like a funny historical reference in this picture as well but mainly i just love the beautiful framing of that and it, it comes it's just come from hustle and sweat um and I mean, and you know, talented genius. Um, sorry, we're like way back. This was such a simple time when I look at these pictures now, but this was for a story about John McCain's presidential campaign post Sarah Palin. And it was, it was all taking place like right at the end of September, beginning of October. And she had already kind of made her mark. Um, and the campaign was fairly in disarray. And, and this, in this cycle, like, John McCain, you know, had run for president in 2000, had then run in the primary in 2008, went broke, almost had to drop out of the race before ultimately getting the Republican nomination. And in like went from being a kind of, I mean, it's wrong to say globalist, but being kind of an interventionist in one way to, to kind of returning to certain strands of Republican orthodoxy. Well, when Lauren Greenfield was actually on the trail for us, they would not let us get anywhere near John McCain. And so, because they were like huddling in a, essentially a crisis, you know, we now understand. And I think this is the book Game Change came out of this election. Um, so this was a picture that she made uh, like while traveling on the campaign plane. And it, it just, a, again, another like, if you, you a, a great photographer who understands the story um, can kind of like find that imagery, you know, find that picture with with or without access and i sort of love that moment um this is peter van Achtmel in afghanistan um i don't really have a lesson here i just love the picture this is mark peterson who again birds um which now by the way i really love birds um <laughs> so this was a um the, the thing about the new york times magazine was it's like getting a graduate degree in life like there's every every story there's just some really interesting kind of fascinating lesson on a topic that you would never have expected. This was about, um, you know, the population of whooping cranes in decline. Um, 
And so these scientists and naturalists have kind of like devised a way to like hatch the eggs in a lab and then um, essentially like entrain the birds to respond to them like in bird, basically bird costumes as, as like mother and father whooping cranes. And then they fly that crazy um, glider along the migration path to teach them how how to migrate from like whatever you know kind of marshes in the middle of America that they go to like down to Florida so they do this every spring um, and as a way to kind of ba build back up the population um, and if you, most of Mark like do you guys know Mark Peterson's work probably because he like he's amazing but if you know his work from the last four or five years you know everything is like totally in the face this like sharp and and his work has been that way for for decades but he can do anything um, and I just love, like, you know, he's, of course, yes, just tell me where to go, get me a cheap hotel, I'll be there. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, it's just, I don't know, it's like learning to work from, from people who I, who I just really respect. Um, this is another moment in history that I look at with, with, I don't know what, sadness and regret. Um, but I, I bring it tonight because... Um, this cover story came out when Anthony, like post Carlos Danger, Anthony Weiner, <laughs> but pre like uh, future incarcerate Anthony Weiner. And so it was like he was coming, making his comeback. He was going to run for mayor. He and Huma was still together. Um, and we had this like very inside profile of the two of them. And he had a bunch of money that he was going to have to give back if he didn't run for mayor this year. And like it ultimately came down to like, that's why he w did the run. It was like he had, he had a war chest that was sort of done. So his like whole public comeback was, um, you know, there was, a, there was like a time limit on it. And he was very nervous for, for press, which again, in hindsight seems crazy because he made that documentary. But um, they, they, we had Eleanor Crucci photograph them at home and it was great but it didn't really make sense for the cover. And so we asked her, you know, can, would you come to a studio and photograph her, photograph them together? And I went to the shoot, they were very concerned. Um, uh, Huma, super lovely. And Anthony was actually lovely too, but um, they were so guarded and he in particular was so tense. And they, they wanted to be photographed like, um, like, in a, like if they were like in a buddy cop movie. Like, like sort of back to back and like, no, you know, no distance. And it, it's the most unnatural pose you can think of. Like y you would only do it for like a silly movie poster because it doesn't, that's not how people relate to each other. So, you know, we asked them like, would you please, you know, would you just hold hands? Two frames, they stood like this. And then they, like it didn't fit the political narrative that they were trying to share of like no space between us. And they were really uncomfortable. But in that moment, like you actually got like something of the two of them actually relating to each other in, in the way that a husband and wife might. Um, and then like, and then you know the rest. But um, it was a really valuable lesson for me to kind of be in that space and, and under, you know, kind of think about um, how do you make something genuine and how do you get somebody, how do you get past the, the veneer that like particularly a public figure is trying to show. Um, uh, this was like a big World Cup project that I worked on in 2012. Um, the, what was the lesson here? I spent a lot of early mornings trying to, all the shoots were in Europe. Soccer players are really like notoriously hard to get time with. None of them want to wear, like, like the, they all get their money from Nike or from, um, or from their team. And the teams hate the World Cup because like they don't, they don't make any money off of it. Like none of that, like sort of none of the FIFA money like comes back. So like if you're going to see like Manchester United or like, I don't know, whatever, Bayern, Bayern Munich, like they just want them to be in their uniforms that they wear as professional soccer players. And we wanted to have them in this whole special thing. I, I don't know. It was just like a really interesting and we did photo and, and, and like high speed video with them um, just kind of like demonstrating moves. But it was like an, it was a crazy access nightmare. And the Ronaldo stuff, we, we just basically had to go, had to send the crew to Spain 
in the hopes that we would get time with him on the day that they said we might. And it was like a, like a multi-thousand dollar investment to make that choice. And I think that was like the lesson, I guess, is like, if you don't go, you definitely won't get the picture. Um, and, and at the end of the day, like the money stuff, like it, it matters, of course. But if, if, you, if you don't have a cover, you know, if you don't have like the most famous soccer player in the world on your cover for your World Cup issue, like that's a bigger problem. Um, so th this project I bring because I, I um, this I think is the moment where I really sort of started to understand, and these are a little bit out of chronological order, but um, where I really started to understand that like I as a photo editor am also in some way an author of the publication that I work with and that that whole midwife story is true and important, but that there are a lot of ways in which being a picture editor just means being an editor and looking at the world and thinking what is interesting, how do I, you know, how are the things that I'm excited about actually something that might relate to the work that we're doing. Um, so this was an, uh, an issue about um, essentially the idea of like nudging people into better behavior, like how do you, how do you green the way that people think? Um, which we still obviously haven't solved. But um, th all of the stories in the issue were about, you know, kinds of that behavioral science trying to change the way that people think about climate change. Um, and this story in particular was trying to kind of like unravel some, some wisdom about like the way that we think about, you know, short-term gain versus long-term um, incentives, et cetera. And so the whole idea was like, the issue, it'll be the green mind. And the editor of the magazine was like, I've got it. We'll get the Blue Man group and we'll paint them green. <laughs> and all of the art and photo people were like, no, anything but that. Um, <laughs> and so um, I had just been with my partner to see um, the dance troupe Molmix, which are like kind of, I think they're actually an offshoot of Palabalus, but they like really interesting, you know, kind of sculptural, playful, um, modern dance and there so much of their work is about kind of creating shapes and isolating body parts and movements in ways that sort of lend to other ideas so um, I said my little reference pictures like what flea moments um, and they went for it and I was just shocked like I, I and so I ended up like making a call to the um, to the founders of the of the dance troupe and Stephen Wilkes and I drove up to their studio in Connecticut and watched these people like in a barn out in the wilderness. Um, and I have really low kinetic intelligence. And so I am just amazed by people who can like do anything beyond like one foot in front of the other. Um, and these people had this whole other, like they didn't talk to each other, but then they would like suddenly like erupt in laughter with like there, there was like a sense of like they had physical communication in a way that I had never experienced before. Um, and it was just great. And they were totally into it. And so we, I bought like $2,000, $3,000 worth of spandex at, in the garment district. And we had all these costumes built. And then they made these kind of crazy shapes with their bodies. Um, it was the most fun I can, I think I've ever had on a photo shoot just because they loved it. Like they, they were having the best time. And this, to get that outline, you know, it was like Stephen would call for them to like, like basically like tense up their bodies to get into the shape, which is a lot of physical work and then take a couple of pictures and then they would all relax. And then, I don't know, it was just magical. Um, but so that's the first time I think that I could truly f like I truly understood, like I have some power to like bring my own ideas into this process. Um, uh, this was a portfolio for the Winter Olympics um, that Ryan McGinley photographed. Um, we had the fashion designers Rodarte create like st strange knit pieces. I, I say strange, but like they were pr pretty strange. Um, to to take it out of like if you ever go like winter sports, they're always like Burton or like some, you know, crazy type. And, um, so it was just to give something that took it out of the realm of being just general sports photography. Um, so like this was Evan Lysacek who won the gold medal that year. They created like a whole, uh, like a, a knit bodysuit for him. Um, that amazing sweater that always makes me think of, there's like a scene from Chicken Run that, that <laughs> I always think of when I look at that picture. Um, 
And this, in this, this is how I like really learned to be a producer. Um, that's the that's the main thing that I learned from this. How to like a months long project, um, really kind of, you know, working with Ryan like understand someone's vision and try to enact it. And so that meant all of the negotiation for the athletes themselves. I was doing, um, you know, working with the publicists and setting up the time and figuring out the schedule. But also then like, we need a snowblower on. You know, we're we're at a ski resort in Colorado, and we need a snowblower. And then you're just the person who goes and like tries to sweet talk someone into giving you a snowblower that you haven't rented or paid for, or like that you've been told you couldn't have when you got there. Um, and but it's all in service of kind of making these magical things. Um, And then I bring this one because I, um, in addition to birds, which I've come around on, love like science-y, natural world things, geology, all of that stuff. Um, and I was like obsessed for a little while with the Northern Lights, and I'm still obsessed with them. But I was temporarily really obsessed with them. And we used to, there used to be this section of the New York Times Magazine called Look, and it was like a single page, and then you turned, and then one big spread of images, either one image or a grid of nine. And, it was like just a constant churn of, you know, oh, we need more ideas for this. The, 52 times a year you have to come up with like some kind of spectacular picture that's totally newsworthy and interesting on its own or like a new way of seeing something. It was torture. And we would have these ideas meetings <laughs> and like you were just constantly like, I don't know. Uh, and for me that was really, really hard because, again, I, I, I started working there um, as I was I, just before I turned 26, I guess. And one of the things that one of the things that limited me in the first five years that I was there was that I always understood that someone older, smarter, more talented, more well-read, um, more like belonging there would just step in and kind of make it clear what was supposed to happen. And that, that anything I said was just kind of like, maybe maybe older, smarter person will make this work for me. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't feel that thing of being, like I didn't have, I think, the kind of like, I wasn't a great advocate for my own ideas, basically, because I just felt like I didn't deserve to be there. Um, and so, I had this obsession with the Northern Lights. We had these meetings every month. It was like you would come in Monday morning and there would be a meeting at 10.30, like ideas for the look pages. And it ruined the weekend. And <laughs> it was just the worst. But I was like, you know what I love? The Northern Lights. I'm willing to look into this in great detail. And um, I hooked up with Simon Norfolk, who was a regular contributor to the magazine. And he also was obsessed with the Northern Lights and with bicycling, which you can do a, like, a, like a, the, a midnight sun ride around the Lofoten Islands, which are in this kind of like weird archipelago, like on the outer part of Norway. And there, it, the climate there is special. It doesn't get as cold, um, like wind currents or something like that. And so the thing that they do is um, they dry cod. Like, like, so there's, there's a lot of like what I would call like a sort of like an antique way or a, like a you know, very traditional way of like working with these fish. And so there was like actually a whole interesting cultural story here, plus also the Northern Lights. Um, and he, we pitched it as a two-pager, and then he shot it, and it was so wonderful. We made it a photo essay in our travel issue. Um, and it, it just, it kind of, it validated my sense of my, like what my own curiosity mattered. Um, and I think that's like actually, I, I think this, as the lesson that I have taken away from being a photo editor generally is like it's really important, of course, to know how the camera works. But if you don't have curiosity for the world, your pictures are not going to matter. They're not going to be interesting because you have to tap into what your own curiosities are and like engage with the broader subject. Even if all you want to photograph are beautiful flowers, like you have to find like a depth of interest in that subject so that your own I'm not, I'm not a fan of this word, but like so that your own passion kind of imbues the photos. Um, and I think that's, that's how I think of this project for me. It was like the, it, I, I had an obsession and, and I caught somebody else who shared that obsession. Um, 
This is a portfolio of actors from British stage actors um, shot by Nadav Kander. Um, again, I was a theater major in college, so this is like just one of those things where like people always look at me when the Broadway part comes in there, like, what do you think? And um, not, not that they think I know, but like you seem, you seem interested in this. Um, Um, and then I moved to Business Week, and Business Week is a very different magazine from the New York Times Magazine, um, and I knew that when I when I went into it. I was at the Times for like ten years, and this position came up, and I knew it to be a really irreverent. Um, uh, to, it had been it had gone through a redesign in 2010 when Josh Cherengill and Richard Turley took over the magazine, and it became. Um, like really bold and smart and crazy and not particularly photographic but incredibly design forward um, and the photo director left and this position came open and I went to talk to them about it and um, I didn't think I could do it didn't didn't it, none of it made sense to me but I was just like I'm you know either you stay at your job forever or you try to do something else and then like succeed or fail and that's all there is to it um, and so I got there, and like the whole way of thinking at Business Week, like the Times Magazine was like very formal, and it was a great. It was like getting a master's degree, and I feel like Business Week was like joining a punk band, like that. That if you had references, like if you brought in Richard Avedon on to them, they would just be like, Pff. and like all of the designers were like, oh, like it's like '90s Time Magazine, like that's what like they were interested in, like this kind of ironical, uh, looking back at peri at like periods that. They're also like all 10 years younger than me. But um, like, like are obsessed with Comic Sans font and just all kinds of like, you know, stock photos and memes. And I got to this job and I was like, I am one of the old people now. Um, and that was really shocking. So I wasn't, I wasn't particularly old, but I was like, I definitely, I was in the crowd of people who know who Listen to Williams is and not the crowd of people who like understand memes. Um, and, um, but I like, when I, when I interviewed for the job, Rob, who was the creative director at the time said to me, you know, he's like, I, we think the, you know, the first rule for us is like, if it, like we think of the magazine as being a kind of like a broken thing. Like if it, if something would work in another magazine, that's a sign that it would be like an issue for us. So it was always like, so like the first rule is break all the rules and I am a very obedient person. And so that was like, that was like a great way to sort of short circuit like all of my own insecurities because you're surrounded by these people who would bring in like, you know, just totally bonkers ideas and, and, and things that, that I couldn't like nonlinear, like no ref, and, and you, I had to learn to play in that sandbox um, and it was really fun. So this is the first cover that I worked on there, um, which was about the like incredibly terrible maternity leave policies in the U.S., particularly for freelancers. Um, and so um, we, I'm married to a doctor, so I was like, can you please like steal some scrubs in the hospital? Um, and everything that's how everything in Business Week is done is like like a shoestring and a and a, a favor. Um, and we did the shoot and. The other crazy thing about this was that um, this like came to me in a dream. Like I, I like was asleep and woke up and was like, "Oh, Emily, the woman who was the editor of the story, like had such like I finally understand the title that she like the headline for the article, labor crisis." And then I got into work and I was like, "Emily, I don't know why I didn't get this. That's such a great headline, labor crisis." And she was like, "I never said that. I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> and, and so like it just like the headline for the story came to me in a dream. And then I then actually what ended up happening is that in this job, I learned a lot more about packaging stories. Um, I mean, I learned a lot from that at the Times Magazine. But in this in this job, I was really in like almost every conversation about that stuff. And I also was looking around and thinking like at the Times Magazine, like there's always Kathy Ryan. There's always, you know, there was Janet Froelich. There was Remy Plessis. There was these great, great minds um, and you just knew like somebody was gonna like definitely kill this if it wasn't good enough. And I, I, I woke up and I was like, no one is, I, I might be the only one who's worried if this is good enough. Like, 
for, for what my standards are from the way that I learn them. And that's not to say like incredibly talented, smart people, but the, the, the timeline was always a little bit faster. And what I would find is that people like would confuse the words great and done and like, like if something was up on the wall and it looked like pretty close to finish, everybody would be like, oh, it's great, it's so great. And I was like, mm, that's, it's fine. It is definitely Wednesday and we ship the magazine, so it's not changing. But like great is, like the upper limit of great is pretty darn high. And we're a business magazine, like we're not gonna hit it every week. Um, and so I started to think about like, looking at the whole picture like is this headline good enough Did, are these things speaking to each other in the right way is somebody else besides me going to speak up and say and actually i should say rob vargas the creative director was also very good at that piece at kind of pushing when things sort of weren't at the level but um i think between the two of us we spent a lot of time thinking about like how do you tell a story what's the how do you kind of shock people into paying attention this was my i think actually second cover there um uh it was for a story about the sort of unraveling of Abercrombie and Fitch as a brand, um, and the like very very gross founder and CEO of that company who's like kind of a racist and kind of a pervert, um, and but also just that uh, like a a sort of a youth brand from the '90s trying to live its way into the 20 teens um, was having a lot of trouble, and so we kind of went into the idea room and. Um, had all these conversations and it just kind of kept coming back to those Bruce Weber campaigns from like he Bruce Weber like shot these magazines for them and they're all like these like hunky like frat dudes and um and we were just like it's irresistible we can't we can't not um so we did this and we did like we did the casting like in the bathroom on the sixth floor of the Bloomberg building and like had all these real people models come in and the guys had a great time and we were, like we had them like doing tug of war and carrying surfboards and all this stuff, and we had these like funny, silly, like fun pictures. Um, Finley Mackay photographed this, and they were they were fun. But then we had this one picture, and I was like, this is this has to be it. There's like it it can't not be this picture because the rest of them are just like goofy, but this actually like makes the strong connection in a way that like is really sharp, and. Um, Notably, the men at Business Week really hated this photo. Um, and it's not it's like so often that you can see that in the gender divide, but like all the women were like, oh my God, it's so great. And the men were just like, oh. And um, uh, an, an important lesson I learned from Kathy Ryan is like every so often, you have to get down on your knees and beg for the right picture. <laughs> I like fully, I was like, you gotta do this. You gotta give it to me. And um, you know what? Jimmy Fallon like showed it on his sh on like his show. It totally it like it hit a register that it wouldn't have hit if it was just like a funny picture of you know guys playing tug of war or whatever. And it's not so often that I felt like I've been in that position, but it was like I really know this is the thing, and um, it was an important lesson. Um, and then there's this just like a parade of weird Business Week covers, and it it really was the most fun job because you could kind of just like say anything and then turn it into a cover, and like it was like it was like the parents were just not there. So this is a story about um, uh, antibiotics getting into the food chain, like it starts with geese and pigs, but then like shrimp are bottom feeders and like the pigs poop in the water and then the shrimp like, it, and then so, but um, in a lot of places where shrimp is coming from commercially is um, like Asia and Southeast Asia and the rules, like the regulations that we have in the US about what kind of antibiotics you can give to animals are probably not what they should be, but like are better than certain other places. And so there's all of these things coming into like the American food chain because they're not regulated in the same way in Asian markets. And th we, we had a great projects and investigations group that was like really long-term investigative projects um, that was adjacent to Business Week, but part of Bloomberg News. And this was a story that, that was generated out of that department. Um, and I, I thought the story was great, but I just, I don't know. It, again, it was just like, what could we do? 
Um, and then you just think of anything. And then we had so many shrimp sketches too, like for this project. I don't know. I love it. I can't remember what the like gross substance is that's inside of the syringe. I think it's a beauty product, but yeah. It wasn't orange juice. It was something really like viscous. Um, we would do this, this issue called the new money issue every year and it was, I now don't even really understand what it was, but like, like but it was basically sort of like looking at all, I mean, looking at people who've come into money in some way in business. Um, and uh, we had one photographer shoot the whole issue, um, Amy Lombard, and we needed a cover and we were sort of playing with, you know, it's like, what's, what's new? What's money? Baby, it's like a wallet. Um, and oh my gosh, the editors, we had a change of editors and the new editors were like, they were like, is it about child trafficking? And <laughs> it's like, I mean, the, 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 one of the other things I learned in, in my theater background is like, no joke too cheap. Like if something is funny, like you can, you can get away with it. Um, and I just, to me, it's just like striking and funny. I, this is one of my favorite covers. Um, and they eventually let us publish it. Again, in the striking and strange and funny category. This was a story about Target's um, trying to like rebrand um, all of their like children's clothing line, which they have now done. And it's called like, it's like Nancy and Jack or Kate and Jack or something like that. Um, but they did a lot of, like the whole piece was about, they had done all this kind of like essentially user testing with like, they let the kids into the design studios to like test out all the looks. Um, and so we kind of had this idea of like little, all these little Anna Wintour's like telling, you know, what these things should be. Um, and I don't know, it was, I mean, again, this is just like in, what did I learn? I, I, the only thing is like what you can, like sometimes seeing a photo editor is about what you can get away with, I think. Like that's like the, whole, that's the overarching lesson of Business Week, I would say. Um, just a favorite. Some of this too is just to give you a context for the magazine versus um, where I had come from before. So this is a, a, a portrait for a story about um, the, um, I'm trying to think of how to, how I should say this. Silicon Valley companies all say they want black engineers, so why don't they hire them? About the, the gap between like the kind of conversation around diversity. And, and this is actually a conversation that's ongoing in um, the photo industry too. Like the, the kind of common refrain about like not, not doing more hiring diversity is like that there's, you know, the pipelines are not there. Like the kids are just not there, you know? And we like go to all the schools and whatever, but, um, but actually like there's an education gap issue, particularly there's a there's a major class issue around um, coding and computer literacy, like because um, by and large, like kids that grow up in areas with less access to computers, with you know who are likely not to have computers at home, like don't from age five or six like grow up learning how to how to program, and so they're they're maybe not like genius programmers at eighteen when they graduate high school or get into college, and so. Um, Google had worked with um, Howard University in Washington, D.C. to establish like a sort of a, a residency, a technologist in residence program and really to build up um, this program to actually like start to build the pipeline for um, uh, engineers of color. Um, and with with mixed success, like they had a they had a really great department head and they had um, a good start, but so the, it was a, actually a great story by Wahini Vara, um, and the, you know, the answer of course is like it's complicated, and so that was a lot of what you come away with from the story. But we wanted to photograph the kids that they had, um, that Wahini had written about. So um, this was shot um, by Christopher Gregory, and I, I, it, it felt to me like, like. This felt like me bringing some of my like real journalistic news magazine portraiture to to Business Week in a way that gave it a little bit more gravitas than it sometimes had. Um, this is Barack Obama. I learned that sometimes you're at a friend's 50th birthday on the day that you're supposed to meet the president. Um, 
this was shot by Jordy Wood. Um, I don't have anything else to say about it. I was at my friend's 50th birthday. Somebody else got to go. <laughs> I also did not meet Vladimir Putin. <laughs> or Mohammed bin Salman. Um, I know, this picture has not aged well. Um, but that's actually a lot of why I brought it. Um, because we were writing about him when he was still the deputy crown prince. Um, it was a major get to like photograph anything in Saudi Arabia is like uh, a major get. Um, and to have like time for an interview and a shoot with somebody who was like such a power broker and then seemingly such a nice guy, um, yeah. Luca Locatelli photographed this um, for us. And we had a huge debate because there was one with like a really Cheshire smile, like, like, a, like a big grin. And I think a lot of us in the art department wanted that picture to be the cover. Um, but we had a whole conversation about, like there was also another very elegant full length portrait of him. And like these are, like when these are in focus, like those two pictures in this corridor are like also like major, like, um, you know, like king and prince type, type uh, family portraits. And we liked that picture, it was very smart, but it, it, there's something felt about like on a, on a magazine, I mean, Business Week, you know, is a global magazine, but mostly in the US, like putting a, a Saudi prince on the cover in this way, like was, we just felt like it actually was meaningful to like reflect the world and like show you someone on the cover that you would like mostly never see in the US. Um, and we liked the grin, but we ended up with this place. And now I guess it's better that we did because He's uh, seemingly an evil person. Um, no lesson here, I just love this cover. Um, this was Tim Cook, photographed by Ike Idiani. Um, this was the, we did a redesign in 2017, I guess, of Business Week. And we were like, kind of like straightening up for tougher times. Um, and which I think, which I think felt right. Like Business Week was zany and irreverent in a period when the rest of the world wasn't, and then the rest of the world has become like the worst, the worst synonym for zany that you can possibly think of. Totally un, you know. Um, and so we were kind of trying to like clean up the grids and like make it all feel a little bit more um, sober. Uh, was this right? Um, and. I bring this because it's like, he's like the Princess Diana of business magazine subjects. Like, you know, he's like, a, he's like that one of those, there's like, you know, him and I wouldn't even know who else, like not even Jamie Dimon, cause he's kind of around, but like, um, like he's like, if you don't get this subject right, it's really bad. Um, and I felt like we, I was on the shoot and working with a photographer, like it was during the developers conference that they do. Um, and we had th three or four different setups and there was a beautiful picture like outside on a kind of stucco wall against the stairs and it was going to, at 4.47 it would have been perfect and he was running 30 minutes late and at 5.20 it was a nothing picture. Um, but we ended up with this which I really loved and, and it just so happens Tim Cook also really loved. Um, this was the night of the election. Um, in 2016, mm -hmm. and we had done, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, we had done. Oh, I should I should be going faster. Um, we had done a big politics issue, looking at like the composition of the electorate. Um, but we knew we go to press on tu on Wednesdays, and the election was on Tuesday. So, and we're not on. We were not on newsstands until like Friday. So we kind of knew like whatever happened. The country was so divided, like things were half of the world was going to be unhappy and we there was not much we were really going to be able to say before press time um and so we always had the idea of like go to both election night parties and like try to get the mood of you know it's like one is laughing one is crying um and then i went to the jacob javits center to um to get that part of the story and then we had um so this is john o ratman and um m scott brower um and i got home at three something that night and had to be in at like 8.30 the next morning to edit pictures with the photographers and try to come up with like 12 pages of like a f photo recapping of the events. And it was, as you can imagine, a hard night, a hard morning. Um, but we, 
I mean, it was the worst. I'm not going to lie. And I'm still, I'm just like actually just like having flashing back to it now. But um, we had to do our job. And that was the thing. It was like we basically like had 24 hours after this, not even 24 hours. We had like one business day into the night to do our job and tell America what happened and why, right? And um, that was a bracing uh, experience and also kind of having to think through like how do you tell, how do you respond to the story? Um, so the, the, we go into these headline meetings and we, we, ha- we found the pictures pretty quickly, but um, it was like trying to get the editors to come up with like the language for a split cover. Like every now and then they just really struggled. And so we were looking at these pictures and they, like this and that and the other. And um, I was looking at that guy and I was like, we got this. Seems like such a funny thing. And so I actually suggested those headlines. And it, it, and it, it was kind of like to me, like it helped sort of like pull together the reason why we were doing the split and not just having like a straight up Trump cover. Um, this is f- a cover story about um, non-union auto parts plants in um, the South. So we, the, it was the, this was in Alabama and basically like a bunch of like safety violations that resulted in like people getting maimed or actually dying. Um, another thing that came out of our projects and investigations group. Um, this is a photo essay by um, Kirsten Luce looking at the, like the, the border wall, the existing fence um, does not actually, like you don't dig it in the middle of the river, like you, it has to be somewhere north of the border. Um, and so there's like lots of spaces in South Texas where there's like even two miles between where the border wall is and where the actual physical border is. And people live there, they farm there, there's public parks and all this stuff. So she pitched this as a kind of looking at the economy of this space that was north of the border, south of the wall. Um, um, this was John Ratman from the Republican Convention, so I just, I just love the picture. Um, that's Philip Montgomery um, after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, this is John Francis Peters at a Trump rally, um, 2017. Um, Sasha Aryutanova in Moscow, uh, like for a city trying to reimagine itself or trying to reimagine its street life. This is an earlier photo essay by Kirsten Luce looking at um, how migrants are tracked, um, which essentially comes down to like footprints. Um, And then I'll show you this. This is one of my um, one of the last photo essays that we produce at that I produced while it was Business Week. Um, this is also Mark Peterson, who you can tell is kind of a hero of mine. Um, he has been doing just incredible work on the on the kind of like you know heinous um, <coughs> violence and hostility in our public discourse uh, in the last five years. And um, he came to me and he was like, I want to do. I want to like look at the the actual cost of free speech because so much of what um, those debates end up being about is like a city like Oakland pays like millions of dollars in overtime hours for police to be on duty to accommodate protesting or like someone like Richard Spencer um, petitions to speak at a university in Florida and then they have to like because they're a public institution they can't deny so they either have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in security or like face a lawsuit from him and people who are backing him. So we picked a bunch of different, um, I mean, he had shot some of these on his own, but then we picked a bunch of different um, uh, events um, around the country uh, where then we actually sort of like got in touch. We had a, a reporter, Susan Burfield, get in touch and actually kind of quantify like the you know, and to me the question, and and it was intentionally provocative, is like, is it worth it? Um, and so I, I loved, I, I think like many people, I, I I had the sense of like how do how in my work do I kind of, I'm I'm a journalist, like I have to sometimes like, if we were going to make a um, a portrait request of Donald Trump, like that email comes from me. And so I can't just go on Facebook and kind of like rant and rave about how awful he is. I am, you know, my first duty is to be publicly impartial, which I'm failing at tonight. Um, And 
I'm also not an investigative journalist. I'm not somebody who's like going out there and reporting on the ground. That's not a part of the work that I do. And like, I actually, like, I'm not gonna lie, like I had a really hard time living that life in the aftermath of the 2016 election. And um, I felt like this was a, like, because Mark is very smart about the things that he's excited about. This was like a really great way for Business Week to talk about the kind of social environment that we're living in. And it's a really great lens through which to consider the questions around, you know, free speech and not, I mean, free speech in particular, but also kind of just the hostility of our current political environment. So I felt really proud that I was able to like trick the magazine into doing this. Um, and, and that Mark trusted me enough to kind of come and pitch the story. Um, I have to stop, so I'm, I'm probably just gonna stop, but I, you're all wondering like, why do I work at Vanity Fair? Um, so I'm just gonna blaze through these pictures that one of the things that I did while I was at Business Week was to, um, um, I worked on our um, a magazine called Pursuits, which was Bloomberg's luxury magazine. And I kind of like got thrown this job when I like was two months into having the Business Week job and really didn't campaign for it or feel prepared at all. Um, and we had to do a redesign of the magazine and kind of figure out like a small team of like eight people basically what it was gonna be and why. Um, and I, I liked it because it was like, having access to pictures that were just beautiful for the sake of being beautiful, um, which I had basically totally given up when I left the Times Magazine to work at Business Week. Um, but it was also an area that like, I wasn't comfortable with. Like I've, I've not done a lot of fashion. I've done celebrity, but not a ton. Um, and uh, again, it was the sense that like, I worked really closely with Rob Vargas um, who did the redesign, um, but just, like all of a sudden I was in this position where you kind of have to create a magazine out of whole cloth. And I would never have said like, I'm the man for this, but it, it also turned out that like over the years, like I've, like, I'm, like I've had become the adult. Um, and so we had a lot, like we had travel, we had like these really, this was Ben Lowy. Um, and he, I'll just tell you that he was not a nature photographer before he got this assignment. And he, he credits me with now all of his crazy like shark pictures. Um, and it was, it was a really, like, it was an education that, like, once you kind of know the, you know, the DNA of, like, how one thing works, you, you can start to see, like, how do you articulate, um, an identity for a different brand, and so I work at Vanity Fair now, um, a lot of why I do that is because one of my old mentors from the New York Times Magazine, Kira Pollock, um, is the deputy editor there. And so I'm running the photo department and working closely with her and with Radhika Jones at a time when they're reimagining what like, you know, a really a real marquee brand has been. And I feel, I would say quite uncomfortable at it, um, but I'm learning like hopefully by like March or April or like 2020, I'll feel like I know how to do it. Um, and so that's the next chapter for me. Um, and then I just leave you with this because it's my favorite favorite. Um, this was a holiday gift guide that we did for Pursuits um, that William Wegman shot. And it was like just one of life's great pleasures to be like let into the way this man, I mean, thinks and works. He's just, a, you know, he's a, he's a mad genius. Okay, and then that's it. Um, so you've been um, <clears throat> in the industry long enough now to see kind of the decline of the, of the you know the magazine publication for sure. And so, what has that done to the photographic process? You know, your role um, as as payroll shrink and these things shrink. So, how, how has that played into all this? And and how do you see the future of it? Well, I don't know how I see the future. Budgets are going to keep getting smaller. That definitely seems true. I think that um, a thing that exists maybe concurrently with that and maybe, you know, maybe there's a correlation and maybe it's actually just a generational thing that's also happening. I feel like when I started working in this industry, um, the kind of like, the, the sort of like primacy of like the photographic genius 
was like so big like that you like the incredible egos and like the this only happens this way and that still exists for sure and it still exists in commercial work but like I think the balance is that a lot of a, like um, we just don't have the time or the staff or the money to deal with all that you know shenanigans and so um but also, I think the world, like, I think a way that young people and or social media have changed the world is, like, the idea of the kind of, like, single iconic picture is, um, like, the, the, like the, the gig is up. Um, and so I think it's much more now about, like, working with people who have a, have a voice, you know, have a, a distinctive voice, but not, like, like, we don't need an Avedon. Like, we don't need an Irving Penn. We need, like, we need a, a, a chorus of, like, photographic visionaries who are reflecting the world as they see it. Um, and that's really exciting. Like, I think a huge part of what's happening at Vanity Fair is, like, Radhika's, like, you know, like, putting people of color on the cover of the, of the magazine, which hasn't happened for like 25 years or possibly ever. And, and so, I mean, that's an overstatement, but, yeah, sure. but then that puts a pressure on me to be, and which I welcome, to be expanding my sense of like, who is a Vanity Fair photographer and who should we be working with and who can we be working with? Um, and like Annie is a fixture and she, and she's actually, you know, she's um, a singular genius and probably the most important photographer like in the world. Um, but we don't need 10 of those. We need that person and then to open the gates and let other people in. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, to sleep at night, that's how I think about the future. Um, and then I have budget fights and I say no to things because we can't afford them. And we think about like, you know, cost per page and like how much you can invest for like a spread in the magazine. Um, some of the time um and then other times you kind of say like well this is going to be really special let's just do it um and then you still fight about the money but um what i'm experiencing from kind of just i've been on this like sort of tour of talking with agents and people who i like didn't used to spend a lot of time talking to at all um you know the what they're saying to me is that people approach editorial work like photographers approach it now as kind of like I find this very quaint, um, you know, like one or two editorials a season. And it's like, you're not making any money. So you you just want to do things that you're excited about and that like feel like they better your portfolio or, you know, might get real traction like out there in the world. And then they go look and do commercial work and try to make a living. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad. I think it's probably both. Thank you. Yeah. I was just curious, as a, a retired actor myself, oh. how did you find yourself at the New York Times? Like, can you do, like give us the crash course and how that happened? So um, I went to NYU, and a lot of people graduate NYU and then don't continue working in the theater industry. Um, a, lot, and a lot of them do. I actually worked, I was a dresser for off-Broadway shows, so like the person who like stands backstage and like zips the zippers and pushes them back out on um, and then like does the laundry and I did that and it, it was like it gave me proximity to working in theater which I was really excited about and then it really wasn't working and so I went to do something else and I got a temp job at a magazine and I had another theater friend who like had a friend from NYU who like somehow be like became a clerk at the New York Times and which the clerks are like the assistant people and they often like hop desks and do and do different jobs different days of the week and so actually how i got into the times was like four generations of theater people like like there was gordon and then alexis and i guess only three um and you know she, my friend had worked with me at a bunch of different places like theater and not theater and she was like this guy is really smart and you should bring him in and they brought me in for a job to work in the graphics desk which I was manifestly unqualified for. And um, I didn't get it. And then I like took a temp job at Citibank and was working on PowerPoint presentations. And months later, like I had worked at a magazine called Biography, which was like in the old days of A&E, long before Dog the Bounty Hunter, um, they, they used to just have like hour long shows about interesting characters from history. And they made an entire magazine to go along with it. And it was like a really easy, safe place to learn what magazines are. 
And, but then on my resume, I had the word magazine. And so they like went back to the file when this job came up in the photo department at the Times Magazine. And they were like, you have magazine experience. You'll be great at this. And I was like, to so it was really just the worst of dumb luck. In the, I mean, we're the best, I guess. But also just be like, be, uh, be kind, be professional, maintain relationships. Um, you know, think about think about things as like potentially having consequences in the future. Can you give us a walkthrough of like the genesis of an editorial meeting? Like at Vanity, you're monthly now, so like yeah. uh, you walk in, you're about to start talking about the first issue. Mm -hmm. uh, walk us through that process. Um, a bunch of editors sit around in a room and. I mean, it's it's really different at, at a monthly because we're like I'm now thinking about, like we're in the middle of January and so mm -hmm. I'm sh starting to shoot for February, um, and that to me is very alien. Um, but it you're looking a lot more. I mean, the hope is to bring more documentary journalism, in some ways, back into Vanity Fair, but the bread and butter of what we do is like, the the intersection of personality and power, as Radhika put it, which I think. Is, helped me understand what the job is. Um, so it's a lot of Hollywood, um, you know, politics obviously, Silicon Valley, um, New York society, but kind of also like expanding that into global society, so, and, and culture more generally. So there's ideas about, um, you know, who is interesting from a celebrity standpoint, who we want to be featuring, um, and you know what's coming up on the calendar, and it's a it's a little more calendar driven at Business Week, where I think at other places I've worked things are calendar driven, but also very news driven. Like, um, so a lot of times, like I might come in with an idea for um, someone that I'd want to be working with, or a, a project that came from a photographer that I might pitch, but the editors generally are looking for like. Um, it, it's much more often in that case that it begins with a subject or it begins with a story. Um, and so we kind of, I don't know, there's a lot of meetings. We come together, we sit down, we like people say things and you ask them, what's that? What does that mean? And then um, kind of try to connect with the writer and figure out like what's possible um, from a photographic standpoint. And then like what's the, what's the most impactful kind of picture that you can make um, if it's, you, you know, of an, indiv an individual subject that's a celebrity or if it's a real person. So, like, for example, Jillian Laub, <laughs> you appreciated that, thank you. Celebrities are real people, I guess. Um, uh, Jillian Laub shot, um, like, a bunch of the gymnasts who had, um, who had come forward about Larry Nasser um, being, uh, you know, being a sexual abuser. And so there was a story that went along with that, but, like, J like Jillian felt like the right voice to kind of get the sort of tension and the sensitivity of that subject. Um, but in other cases, it's like, you know, like, it's about the mix. Like, do we, you know, do, this is much more true than with weeklies, although we always thought about the mix. But like, is there a lot of color in this issue? Like, what's the palette like overall? Because if three stories come in and they're, you know, and they're all in a kind of green, brown, neutral space, in a monthly magazine, that is a huge, like you really feel that in a way that like some weeks some weeks business week was not as photographic and other weeks it was very photographic and you just kind of like shrugged it off and it was like well the next week will just be different um but in a monthly there are only 12 <laughs> and so you have to really get that right so it, it, um things change a lot um like in the course of a close like you know we're we're talking about we're really talking about february now we're really living the, our holiday issue, which is the, the month formerly known as January. Um, and really in the close of that and kind of putting things in layout, but thinking about the mix and thinking about who should be shooting, what should we be photographing for the February issue. But then it also changes because, um, you know, things come in and the mix doesn't feel right. So a story might get held or killed, um, not, not killed so often, but, but if there's something that doesn't have a time peg, that, then that might move to get in like something that's more colorful or to get us a dose of politics that we want. Um, because believe it or not, Vanity Fair is a general interest magazine. And so you really do want to be representative of like a broad array of kinds of storytelling. Clinton, thank you so much for a stellar lecture. That's all oh, thanks. Have. Yeah.